reporting. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Peter Peterson. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can people see that okay? Yes. Perfect. All right. Thank you. I, uh, WebEx was giving me a little grief this morning, and so I had to switch browsers and just wanted to make sure everything worked okay. All right. So uh, hi again. Um, <clears throat> as Dr. Sherman said, my name is Peter Peterson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, most of my research work centers on cybersecurity education. Um, I'm also interested in kind of systems and security in general. Um, and as a sidelight, uh, we have a, a functional PDP-12 from 1972 in our lab that we do demonstrations in education and, and hack around with, and that's kind of fun too. That has nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, Today, I'm gonna to talk about identifying common sense misconceptions in cybersecurity. Uh, this is part of a larger uh, SATC project on addressing, um, identifying and addressing misconceptions in cybersecurity. Um, and it's joint work with a number of my uh, grad students over the last several years. Um, <clears throat> so people often have uh, common sense misconceptions about things. Um, in particular, physics is kind of the classic example um, that uh, people have these uh, ideas, for example, that heavier items fall faster than lighter ones. Okay, And I'm realizing I can't see my timer, so I'm just going to set one. Um, people uh, think that heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones, but, you know, I think it's okay that um, people often think that because do you know who else thought that? Well, of course, uh, Aristotle. Uh, also believe that. He wrote that heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones. It was part of his kind of um, worldview. Uh, he thought that everything wants to return to its rightful place. And of course, objects made of earth want to return to the earth. If they're heavier, it's because they have more earth. Uh, and so they fall faster. And so that, that was Aristotle's uh, perspective. And it's hard to blame him because, I mean, Aristotle's a pretty smart guy. Um, but also, it came took until Galileo, almost 2,000 years later, that he, uh, you know, demonstrated, proved that the rate of, of fall is equal, of course, if we're eliminating um, gravity, or not gravity, air friction. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, a fun fact about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which may be apocryphal that he dropped these objects from here, but um, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was built in 1173, and it almost immediately started leaning. Um, and I just think, man, how frustrated would you be if you like spent all that time? Uh, and so Leaning Tower of Pisa, like as they continued to build it, they like modified it uh, to keep it from, um, from leaning. So it's not even a, like a square structure. It's very fascinating, but off topic. Um, so why do people think that heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones? Uh, it's because on Earth, they often do. Like, it's a reasonable misconception, right? Aristotle was not um, uh, crazy to think that maybe that's how things are supposed to work, right? Because often heavy objects are, are dense objects. Lighter objects that are, are handy are, you know, leaves and feathers and string and, and things like that that are going to be more uh, subject to air friction. Right. And this gets at an idea of misconceptions that misconceptions are often based on um, observations that humans make um, and their intuition about why those observations work uh, the way that they do. And that makes it hard for people to unlearn the misconceptions that they've learned um, because they kind of seem um, based on their their personal experience, what they've seen with their eyes, what they experienced when they fell, uh, and so on. Uh, and people tend to fall back on intuition um, when we don't know the answer, right? We use our intuition as kind of a heuristic 
uh, to, to guess at the right answer. Uh, but if our intuition is false, um, then even if we're reasoning sort of um, correctly based on the premise, we're going to make a mistake. Okay. Um, so uh, what can we do about that? And um, before I, I get to what we can do about that, um, does anybody know why there's a picture of uh, Hydrox cookies here? And while you think about that, I'm going to rearrange my windows a little bit so that I can, um, so that I can see the chat. All right. Can you still see my slideshow? Yes. All right. Perfect. So, so why do I have Hydrox cookies on a slide about misconceptions? Um, Cyrus says because they're better um, than the copy. Uh, anybody else? Why Hydrox cookies? It's like a meta. Yeah, so Cyrus did some Googling, uh, right? Uh, oh, no, better than the copy. No, he knows. I'm sorry, I misread you, Cyrus. My, uh, my sincere apologies. Of course, Cyrus knows this. Hydrox were actually the original sandwich cookie, right? And, but if you grew up in you know this half of the 19th century or or, or growing up in the or 20th or 21st century, you think that hydroxes are kind of these like knockoff Oreos, right? That's the misconception, but that's a reasonable misconception because hydrox cookies are not, you know, remotely as popular as Oreos, right? Um, and so it's a reasonable assumption to make. So the question is, what can we do about um, misconceptions? Um, so what we can do, hopefully, is identify those misconceptions and then remediate them in some way, right? Identify what is it that people have as a misconception about this thing that we care about, and then find ways to remediate them in a targeted way. Um, I wish I could say that I invented this idea in STEM, um, but it kind of goes back to, um, at least in, in the education world, it's kind of a foundational work by Haloon and Hestinus um, in 85. And um, the first paper was called The Initial Knowledge State of College Physics Students. And they were physics teachers. And they realized that a lot of the first year uh, physics students made the, just the same mistakes over and over. Okay, And it wasn't just like the same mistakes about certain concepts. They literally would, would come up with the same answers about those concepts because they had a, a functional misconception that they used in solving physics problems that was just false, right? And so having had the experience of teaching this, they said, oh, I think we can make a list of these misconceptions. And so they did. And then they said, well, we want to make questions to figure out if people know this or not. Um, and multiple choice questions are actually a really good way to um, assess things um, psychometrically. Okay, so that, that's like a whole uh, other presentation. But, you know, if you're going to evaluate a test like uh, we have with the CCI and the CCA or, or standardized tests, it's really nice to have um, multiple choice questions because the grading is unambiguous and you can do all kinds of st statistical analysis. But before that, they said, what we're going to do is write a bunch of open-ended questions about these misconceptions. And then we're going to collect all the wrong answers that we got from the students. And we're going to identify the most frequent wrong answers. And those wrong answers will be the multiple choice question. That's MCQ, the multiple choice question distractors. And a distractor in the uh, language of multiple choice questions, those are the wrong answers. Alternatives are all the, the answers. Distractors are the incorrect subset, and then the right answer is the right answer. Um, so that's what they did. They collected all these wrong answers, uh, selected the distractors from the wrong answers, and then created and validated a multiple choice test, which is called the FCI or force concept inventory. And it's all about uh, Newtonian physics, okay, the kinds of stuff uh, that we've been talking about that Aristotle had wrong and so on. Um, and then they created a curriculum that attempted to address those misconceptions directly. So state, you may think that 
you know, heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects, but that's wrong. Here's why we can prove it to you. We can do lessons that um, directly attack that misconception so that later in their life, perhaps as a rocket scientist, uh, when they're like, oh, I don't really know how that works. Instead of falling back on the intuition that they may have had before from growing up as a human being in an atmosphere full of air, they think back to that lesson in physics where uh, they learned that that's not really how it worked. Um, a classic example of this kind of activity to me is like the pendulum demonstration, right? Where somebody stands up again, you know, back against the wall, starts the bowling ball on their face and they let it go. And of course it feels like it's going to hit you in the face. Right. But of course the pendulum is always going to decay. And so it, it can't, right. If you didn't move, the bowling ball is not going to hit you. And that's a pretty memorable demonstration. Um, and so um, that's essentially what they did uh, with the FCI. Um, and the test can then be used to show kind of the knowledge state of students. It can be used to show progress. Did the students after the class um, get these things correct? Uh, or are they still demonstrating these misconceptions? Um, that's the kind of thing that they did. It's this hugely influential work that then spawned a large number of concept inventories in, um, in STEM. And I think is definitely a, a foundational source for the CCI and the CCA. Um, although I wasn't around when those projects started, um, it's definitely a part of that lineage. Um, I'd also like to say, uh, usually when I give, um, I don't, when I teach, I usually teach from notes and I scribble on the notes and I ask people for questions and things. Um, so if people have questions, uh, feel free to speak up or throw a question in the chat. Um, but I'll stop here for a second and just ask, does anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Or comments? Comments are good too. All right, um, I'll keep going just for time. So a natural question then for this work is, can cybersecurity misconceptions be common sense, right? So a lot of times when I talk to people about this project, they think, well, but yes, of course, it makes sense that humans have these, you know, misconceptions about physics because we're limited human beings in an atmosphere with air, et cetera, et cetera. You know, are cybersecurity misconceptions really common sense misconceptions? Like, where did they come from? Or are, are these really like equivalent things? And my argument for that, which you may or may not um, buy, but my argument is that most people today, the kind of college students and people that we're thinking about educating this way, have spent an entire life with essentially modern computer technology, right? One of the cool things about the PDP-12 from 1972 is that it basically works just like a modern computer. I mean, you can write Fortran for a modern computer. You can write Fortran for the, the PDP-12. There's a basic interpreter. You know, it has a pretty weird instruction set, but it's just assembly language. Right, computers have been pretty much the same for a long time, and now they're ambig or, you know, uh, ubiquitous. Right, I've got my phone. We all have our laptops. They all kind of work the same way. And m my belief is that the way that computers work, at least visibly to users, kind of gives them these misconceptions about how things are in reality. Um, even though in practice or in reality, they're not that way, right? So some classic examples um, that I expected to find um, with this research were things like, if I delete a file, it's actually gone, right? That was a misconception that I thought would come highly out from our experts, right? But as probably most of you know, when you delete a file, uh, what actually happens? When you delete a file, what actually happens? When you delete a file, what, what's actually going to happen? Yeah, so uh, goes goes to the recycle bin. Uh, Cyrus is normally a header for the files removed. Yeah, so you remove the directory entry, the listing for the file, and you mark the blocks that are on the disk as being available for reuse. But we don't actually usually overwrite those blocks in a 
in a commodity, you know, commercial operating system, because that takes time. And so the data persists usually on the disk until those blocks end up getting reused in some way. Okay. And so that it's a reasonable common sense misconception, I think, for users to believe that files actually get deleted when they're deleted, because to the user, it's gone. I can't get it back. It doesn't exist anymore in how it's presented to the to the user. But in reality, and, and if you have a level of expertise where you understand this, you know that that data is still there. And so I think that users can have similar persistent misconceptions about security based on the way that they understand and interact with technology. So that's uh, essentially our project is to kind of recreate or repeat uh, Haloon and Hessenis uh, methodology for physics, but in the realm of cybersecurity. Um, and so first, we need to identify a list of important cybersecurity misconceptions and then create a concept inventory and validate it, which just means it's fair, the questions aren't too hard, they're correct, and so on. And then create activities or curricula to attempt to remediate those particular misconceptions. Um, Will the results of this project be the list of the most important cybersecurity misconceptions? I can't really speak to that, right? What I can say is that these are important misconceptions that a group of experts found uh, repeatedly or, or mentioned repeatedly. And my belief is that a concept inventory can show whether students hold our misconceptions and that it's reasonable to assume that if you have a student who um, doesn't hold these common misconceptions as identified by an expert, they probably have a better understanding of cybersecurity and misconceptions in general. Um, but this gets into that, like where the intersection of, you know, hard science and social science uh, interact, we might want to be able to say, well, these are the most important misconceptions of cybersecurity. I can't really say that. Um, but I think that having this list um, from a large number of experts gives us an important target for education. All right, uh, any questions or comments about that before I move on? Okay, so here's our methodology. We surveyed a large number of researchers and professionals. Um, so Haloon and Hestinus, who taught first year physics, um, they, uh, Good question, Alan, that I will get to uh, towards the end of the presentation, but I will definitely circle around. Um, they identified the list of misconceptions that they saw in their own teaching. And I could do that for myself, um, but I wanted to have a broader sense of what does the community think are important misconceptions to make sure that I wasn't missing ones that just didn't seem to intersect with my class or that I didn't recognize. So we surveyed a large number of published researchers and cybersecurity professionals, uh, practitioners. And what we asked were, what are more, one or more of the most common and important misconceptions or mistakes in area X of cybersecurity? Where X was a number of areas, network security, application security, data security and encryption, physical security, privacy, access control, and uh, other, did we miss another area? And then we also asked them, why do you believe these misconceptions or mistakes occur? So th those were our two questions in these, um, I think, seven areas. We asked about mistakes, even though this is really supposed to be about misconceptions, because people sometimes have a hard time articulating a fundamental misconception. Um, that's also why we asked, why do you think they occur? to try to get these experts to say, well, I think people are doing this because they believe whatever, all right? Um, and also because it's easy for people to articulate, oh yeah, I see people do X all the time. Um, and then we can kind of back form a misconception from that based on their reasoning. We sent it out to about 3000 people, um, mostly um, uh, Usenix, ACM and IEEE, uh, published security authors, and we got 86 responses, which is about a 3% response rate, which is obviously uh, small. Um, but uh, as Alan uh, and I know, it's hard to get people to respond to things. And so we uh, took a big shot. Um, this is a duplicate slide. Um, so then 
once we had the survey results, we had to create a code book. And if you haven't done um, like social science coding process, what a code book is, is um, a list of all the themes that you are going to identify in the data that you've collected through a survey or other open ended um, method. Okay. Um, so it's funny to talk about coding, right? Um, but coding then means I go through the list of all of that data and I tag responses with the individual codes that I see in that data. Okay. So we had to create a code book to then go through and code our data. But once again, we really didn't want to just identify our pet misconceptions, right? I talk about misconceptions in my class and my students are my students. And so we wanted to have a list of misconceptions that we did not ourselves generate. And so the way we did that is we got a group of volunteer experts who were all um, cybersecurity um, educators. Um, and we sent every response to at least two of those experts. In other words, everybody got a random subset of our data. And those experts read through the data and they made a list of all the unique misconceptions that they saw mentioned in the data. Okay. And then my RA and I went through the codes from all of those experts and unified them together to make a single list of misconceptions. Okay. Um, we also eliminated some that um, only one person saw, for example, because that couldn't possibly be a most popular misconception if it was only seen by one person. So, for example, a number of experts said similar things about encryption. Encryption makes everything secure. Uh, encryption solves all problems. Uh, encryption is more important than other access control mechanisms and so on. Um, and we unified those things into you know, uh, crypto is a silver bullet, but to use the metaphor, um, the use of cryptography itself solves all cryptography problems. This idea that crypto is this panacea, it's an, um, magic dust that solves security problems. So we went through this for all the data from our experts and came up with a hundred unique misconception codes. And those are the codes that we then would use to actually code the data ourselves. So any questions about the codebook creation mechanism or why we chose to do it this way? All right. Um, then the RA and I use that codebook um, to count appearances of the codes in the data. So we have, um, uh, 85 or 86 responses. And we went through each of those responses that responded to those seven questions. And we tried to identify whether a particular code appeared response or not. Okay. Um, each code could only appear in a response one time. So if you think about the individual pieces of text that we got, we had hundreds of individual pieces of text because we had multiple answers from each participant. But each participant only represents one person's opinion. And so we didn't want one person to um, skew the frequency of a particular code because it's just their favorite thing, right? And, and we saw that in some of the responses where people would, would keep saying, you know, crypto solves everything, crypto solves everything. We think crypto solves everything for every area of, of security. We didn't want that to count seven times for one response because it's one person's opinion. So each code appeared once per response. Uh, the uh, RA and I coded all the responses side by side. And so rather than having a um, agreement measure where we say how much we agreed on, we actually agreed on everything and we discussed anything that we weren't sure about. Um, so it's sometimes in coding things like this, you'll see a reliability measure that essentially says how much the coders overlapped. But instead of doing it asynchronously separately, we did it together. And so what we got out of that is a count for each of those hundred codes. How many times did that code appear in the set of 80 some responses? And um, this is just a graph here to kind of show you how those codes dropped off. Um, the, the codes here are the PP codes because that's Peter Peterson and we unified those codes from the expert codes. Um, again, that you're really just supposed to see the curve, but you can see that many things appeared 
above 10, you know, let's say one, two, three, four, five, five, six, uh, and then they kind of drop off. And then we get down here to codes that really only appeared uh, two times, three times, one time. Okay. So um, that's how we got our misconceptions count. And then we essentially focused on this top list. Uh, and so now I'm curious what you think are the most common misconceptions that appeared in the results. So we'll take a minute and you can put them in the chat. Uh, chat would probably be easiest or you can say them out loud if you can't chat um, for some reason. I learned today that the WebEx native client for Linux doesn't allow you to chat. It can do video and audio, but it, they apparently haven't figured out how to type text into boxes. Um, what do you think were the most common misconceptions? Any guesses? An internet connection, ooh, is needed to be hacked. That's a good one. While you think about that, um, I'll, I'll come back and read these, but I'll answer Alan's question. How does the CI, uh, my CI differ from the CCI? Um, it differs from uh, the CCI in that we are targeting the specific misconceptions that came out of our survey process, as opposed to targeting important concepts in cybersecurity that were identified by experts. So experts came up with the content items but for mine, there are specific misconceptions about cybersecurity. And for the CCA, it's about important concept classes in cybersecurity. Um, that's the most fundamental difference. And then I guess the other differences are that the wrong answers are at least originally based on observed wrong answers from an open-ended question process. Um, those are the biggest differences. So crypto has no issues with security. Um, internet connection needs to be hacked, um, limiting the adversary, lack of nuance, yes, crypto and other narrow actions solves many problems. Those are all really good answers. Um, let's see uh, what we came up with. So um, when we did that, uh, we looked at the, the things that were, were pushing 10 or above in terms of frequency. And again, this is a count out of, I apologize, I can't remember if it's 85 or 86 right now off the top of my head, but it's the number out of that number that referenced this misconception. And so later I'll show this as a, as a percentage, right? But you know, 29 out of 80 something is of course pushing half of the responses mentioned this in some way, okay? Um, and, and going down, so crypto is a silver bullet, um, only the cryptographic algorithm matters, nothing about um, key management or application or cipher mode or things like that. Just as long as you're using AES, you know, that's the important thing. Um, physical security is uh, easy or ignorable, so you don't need to worry about physical security. Um, I'll answer your question in uh, just a second. Uh, I'm not a target, of course. This is a classic people thinking that they're not targets because um, what they have isn't valuable per se. Um, I have a couple dogs in here, so they're going to jingle around. Um, it's okay to make assumptions about uh, security or, or limiting adversarial thinking. So Alan uh, hit that one right on the head. Um, simple kinds of access control are okay, and so on. And so this is the list going down. Um, Richard, what people mean by crypto is a silver bullet is essentially saying that if I encrypt data, it is secure. I encrypted it. And so how could it have been um, leaked, right? Or, but I have an encrypted hard drive. What do you mean I have malware on my computer, right? Or I encrypted the data that's going over the network. So how could the attacker have learned anything about that data? Because it's encrypted, right? But of course, encryption has sort of limited uh, capabilities. It's this amazingly powerful tool, but there are some things it doesn't do. Um, and we can talk about what some of those things are later. I don't want to give away some answers. Um, does that answer your question, Richard? Um, awesome. And so we looked at these misconceptions and we see, you know, we wanted to kind of keep the misconceptions separate, 
Um, but a number of these are really related to each other. And in thinking about making a CI, we wanted to have distinct um, classes of misconceptions that we would target. So different groups of questions to target the different kinds of misconceptions. And this is very similar to what the CCI does. And so we grouped into seven groups um, about crypto, physical security, security controls, um, privacy and anonymization, and so on. And these are the, the groups. Um, and so when you total up all the crypto items, right, and all the physical security items and so on, this is kind of the weight of those classes or categories of misconceptions. I said category in the weirdest way ever. Oh, well. Uh, so crypto is a silver bullet, uh, over 60 out of 86, right? So almost every respondent mentioned security being or cryptography being seen as more important than it really is um, and so on. Um, so adversarial thinking was a really big one. Um, a lack of thought about physical security was, a, was another frequent um, subject. And some of these answers you'll see were a little contradictory, but they all kind of had this idea that you didn't have to worry about physical security. Another frequent idea was that security controls worked 100% of the time for whatever they were supposed to protect against. So, you know, a firewall blocked all unwanted traffic, you know, anti-malware stops all malware. Cryptography stops all uh, confidenti confidentiality attacks, right? Um, I'm not a target, of course, is, a, is another one pretty easy to understand. Simple versions of access control are okay. Um, a major component of that was at least privilege isn't essential um, or that all or nothing access control is, is safe. You can um, give people you trust more access than they really require and so on. And then the smallest category, actually, I guess the last two are equal, but uh, people talked about anonymization and privacy. Um, the most common idea was that something like K-anonymity was undefeatable, right? Um, if you strip uh, identifiers and you strip um, highly uh, unique records, then um, data could still be used, but couldn't be de-anonymized. That was a very frequent idea. All right. Let's break down um, the categories a little bit. So crypto is a silver bullet was in 77% of the responses. So things like if it's encrypted, it's secure. Um, only the algorithm matters. Rolling your own crypto is a good idea. Crypto automatically provides authenticity protection or integrity protection. Those were the kinds of things that um, kept coming up over and over. Um, the top two and the third one there were by far the most common. Um, anybody can jump in at any time, but um, just for time, I'm going to keep going. So it's okay to make assumptions about security. So I don't need to think um, about what an attacker might do. Uh, I can trust people to use things the right way and to not make mistakes. Um, it's easy to do secure design, and I will trust that people actually do design things securely, um, that defaults are secure, and so on. Um, I mentioned this a couple times, so I'll breeze over this, but just a total lack of awareness of physical security. Um, air gapping is perfect. Um, a locked door is sufficient. Um, other people said, well, uh, I think the misconception is people think physical security is impossible, and so they don't even try anything to uh, improve it. Uh, the next category here is that security controls, again, are perfect. Again, a control for X stops all uh, attacks of class X. Okay. Um, I'm not a target. My data isn't worth anything. I'm not a nation state, so I don't need to worry about targets. A failure to understand that attacks are often automated and will just compromise anything that's vulnerable. Um, and maybe that some data doesn't require encryption because it's not important. Um, sometimes I think I'm not a target is really just a failure of thinking adversarially. And this is kind of an aside. Um, the reason that it exists as a separate misconception is because the idea of I'm not a target was so common in the data. And I think of that, um, it's like, I don't even need to think adversarially kind of because no one is interested in me. Um, so it may be a subset, but it feels like an important subset. Again, simplistic access control is okay. Uh, least privilege, 
thinking permissions are easy and so on. And then anonymization and privacy. Um, this was by far the most controversial topic. So a number of experts said, ah, privacy is dead. So, you know, you think this is important, but it's not important because it doesn't really matter. Or they say privacy is impossible uh, and so on. Um, so uh, th this one was kind of controversial. Any questions about these categories while they're handy? Okay, so these are the categories then that are informing the creation of the CI, right? And so um, we've drafted about 30 open-ended questions um, with questions from each of the areas. So our, our hope was to have four questions from each of the seven areas. Um, we have a couple extra questions and so on, so it's not exactly right. Um, and we're in the process of gathering responses for the distractors by um, giving the exam to open-ended exam to CS students who haven't taken a security class. And so we really want to just know what they think the answers are. Um, and if they don't know the answer, what they think a plausible answer is, because that's going to get at what their actual misconception is. Um, then once we have those distractors, we're going to be converting them into multiple choice questions. We'll have experts review the questions to make sure they're factually correct and so on. And then that leads to the validation study where we give the multiple choice test to hundreds of students and essentially make sure that all the questions are good, that the good students do well on most questions, um, bad students do poorly on most questions. There aren't questions where those trends crisscross, where the, the bad students do really well on a particular student question and the good students get that question wrong, that indicates a, a problem with the question. Um, has anyone looked at misconceptions in security in general versus cybersecurity? Not that I'm aware of, Alan, but um, I haven't, I've been heads down on the project, so I haven't really looked into that in specific, but that's a great question. Um, so I can talk about some, some sample questions. Um, for example, uh, located in the United States, uh, Alice uses a standard encrypted web connection to download one of two files, full Star Wars Episode 4 MP4, or trailer Star Wars Episode 4 MP4 from a server in China. An adversary is situated on the network path between Alice and the server and can see Alice's data transferred over the network. However, since it's encrypted, the adversary cannot read the raw unencrypted data. What's the most likely way the adversary could tell which of the two files Alice is downloading, even though the data is encrypted? So um, I imagine this crowd will probably be able to answer most of these questions correctly, right? Because the idea is if you have taken a security class and you understand how things like cryptography work at a basic level, um, you'll understand the answer to this question. Um, Anybody want to take a stab at it? Um, Alan, I will use four distractors because of our experience with cats. Getting that fifth distractor is really hard. So what's the answer here? You didn't know there would be a quiz. Yeah, the size of the data is first very obvious, right? It's not guaranteed. But even if the data is encrypted, the size of that file is almost certainly going to differ, right? Assuming that the video is the same resolution, um, the size is going to differ. The trailer will be much shorter than the full movie, OK? There are other ways, right? We could hack the person's computer. They could break the encryption, um, et cetera, et cetera. But just observing the otherwise secure data transfer, you could very likely infer what the file was. How about adversarial thinking? Uh, you're a developer for Pizza Plus Plus, a new online only pizza delivery company. The previous developer had created a shopping cart where people could create and customize orders. You've added the purchase component, showing the price of the items in the cart, the applicable tax, and a text entry field allowing the user to add a numeric amount to tip the driver. The tip is added directly to the other cost to produce a total amount owed. Your online processing payment processor handles charging the cards. 
So what is the most obvious potential flaw in the system? How could you put on your adversarial thinking hat to uh, attack this system? Any ideas? A text field for the tax. So the tax uh, is calculated. You can't change the tax. The payment processor could be compromised, right? That is possible. Um, but I don't think it's the most obvious potential flaw. So to me, the most obvious flaw is that the tip is added directly to the other cost to produce a total amount owed. So I could put in a negative tip, for example, uh, and discount myself because that's just added to the total amount owed. So if I adversari think adversarially about how this application produces, those are the kinds of things I would immediately try as opposed to trying to compromise a payment processor, for example. Um, we have some time here. So this is a good one. Uh, even though it's in space and was not connected to the internet at the time, the International Space Station's computers were once infected with malware. What is the most likely explanation for how this happened? Uh, this actually happened. So if that helps you. <laughs> Aliens. Yeah, so it was a flash drive. An astronaut brought a flash drive onto the space station, and it turned out that there was malware on the flash drive, right? And so the computers on the space station actually got malware, right? Yeah, found it in the parking lot. On their way to the on their way to the lunch, there was a USB stick and curiosity killed the cat. Um so I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of these questions, um, but uh, I'll put them here. I'll give them a second. And if you want to go back and look at the video, you can uh, look at these questions because um, I want to finish up the thing and, and have a little Q&A. Um, sometimes it's really hard to ask questions about misconceptions without providing a lot of detail. Um, and so this is actually a very easy question about access control, but requires a lot of things to be specified, um, which I wish I wish it were simpler. We've spent a lot of time trying to make things simple. Um, all right. So uh, in addition to the CI and validating that, we're also in the process of making at least one hands-on activity per misconception that would be integrated into a class. And so... Um, things like visualizing the limitations of cryptography to show how things like length is not hidden, to show how things like codebook mode reveal uh, repeated blocks in the data and so on. Um, there's a number of, of different things here. Uh, the thing we're working on right now that I'm really excited about is a, a text adventure um, that you use uh, household objects and simple uh, physical penetration testing uh, techniques to break into offices in an office building at night and steal the contents um, inside the, the rooms. It's kind of hard to do hands-on physical security uh, demonstrations um, via the web, right? And so we thought a text adventure would be a nice way, a very simple text adventure to help illustrate these ideas. So future work, uh, in, in, in addition to validating the test, of course, is using it in experiments. So pre-post testing with the security course, testing performance after the activities on the misconceptions, uh, relevant questions, um, and some videos to accompany that curriculum. Um, so that's, that's kind of working down the road, but the main work right now is completing that test. So as a conclusion, um, misconceptions, you know, are a hindrance to learning. Uh, we really don't want to keep repeating the classic mistakes in cybersecurity that have been dogging us for decades. And um, experts clearly believe that novices have some repeated misconceptions. And we are trying to target uh, concept inventory for these seven categories of misconceptions. Um, uh, 
uh, with a concept inventory, and then we'll have some hands-on activities to try to remediate um, each of those misconceptions with the goal, hopefully, of improving education and cybersecurity overall. Um, that is the end of my presentation. So I would love to take any questions or discuss anything that people might have in the next few minutes. I have a class um, at the next top of the hour, so I'll probably need to go at about 5-2. Any questions or, or comments? Alan, was that a, a question? It's an adversarial comment. You, you said that misconceptions are a hindrance to learning. Well, maybe to some mm. extent, but, but I would say you can, a, a skillful educator can twist it and, and make it facilitate learning because there's no better way to motivate a student to understand what's right than than to prove them wrong yes yes i i absolutely agree um i i would clarify or add the context that ignoring misconceptions um is uh detrimental to learning right people have them and um they are like the secret the devil whispering in the ear of the of the student in the classroom so i agree 100 percent. In, in in fact it's a classic provenly good instructional technique, especially in constructivism education, to begin with an exercise that reveals a misconception. Like, like you show a student uh, a tennis can with three balls and ask him, is it taller or is the girth longer? Mm -hmm. And then and then give them a measuring tape and have them measure. And, and it's quite interesting to see their reaction. Yes, yes. Uh I, I agree. Um, Brian asks, any thought on where this ceases being a cybersecurity issue and starts to be more educational and psychological? Um, I mean, I think it is educational in that we're using classic educational techniques to do this work. Um, and so there's, it's very informed by educational approaches. Um, as far as psychological, I think um, it can be informed by psychology in simple ways. For example, what are the best ways to get people to change their mind? Or what are the best ways to get people to um, you know, recognize a misconception? Um, I think we could go deeper on that than we are. We're just trying to challenge them by, by demonstration. Um, so that would be part of it. I think there are also some of these misconceptions like I'm not a target or adversarial thinking um, are potentially psychological um, or related to psychology, right? How do we get people to recognize you are a target when maybe something about human psychology uh, shortcuts and says, well, I'm not a target because I'm not immediately threatened. Um, I think there's some work that could be done there. Um, and other ideas like, you know, there could be a psychological component to why people think that rolling your own crypto is a good idea. Um, I think that's also another possibility. And, and more generally, um, what misconceptions are really special for security and, and what misconceptions that you've uncovered are more abstractions of more general misconceptions? Yes, I think that's, I think that's absolutely a good question uh, that we are not trying to tease out at all because, you know, from a cybersecurity education perspective, I think our top seven categories are pretty important for people to understand in a cybersecurity class. And so is the physical security one really cybersecurity specific? No, it, it's pretty applicable in the non-cyber world as well. But is it essential for cybersecurity students to know? I would say yes. So that's, I think, a way that you could go deeper, both educationally and psychologically on some of these issues. Other questions or comments? What have you learned from the CATS project that helps you do this? Oh project? man, so many things, uh, so many things. Um, not having a fifth distractor for sure is a big one um, because it's so hard to come up with them and they're often not very good. Um, originally, when I proposed this project, we did not propose validating the test um, because I didn't even really understand how to do that. And 
working with the CATS project gave me a lot of understanding uh, about the importance of that and how to do that and so on. Um, so that's a major aspect of it. Um, those those are the things that are, you know, writing the tests. I mean, Alan is going to definitely recognize this scenario question format because I've adapted it um, straight from the CATS project. Um, those are really, I think, the big ones working in a team to create and workshop questions, um, all of that. So many things we, we have borrowed a lot of ideas and experience gained from cats to make this successful. Can you say more about how you plan to mitigate the misconceptions? Sure. And, so and, and what, what are your strategies in particular? So the each of the exercises, and I, I wish I had some to demonstrate today, um, will come with an introductory paragraph that directly talks about um, people often believe X, however, that's not true because of, you know, um, ABC. And uh, here is a demonstration to demonstrate the misconception in action and, and what happens if you believe that misconception, kind of showing how things go wrong and how they could go right um, in a, in a web-based uh, activity. So we want it to kind of be like zero effort for people to to take them or instructors to use them. Um, and then following that, there will be a like a little comprehension test, not with questions from the concept inventory, but basically trying to figure out, did you learn what we expected you to learn from this activity? And these aren't assessment tools, they're really tools um, for the student's own self-reflection. So if they're getting those questions wrong, then they can go back and either uh, answer them again or go through the activity again and, and try to learn it that way. And then kind of some like see also reading at the bottom for, you know, rip from today's headlines or other articles uh, referencing that kind of misconception. And the idea here is that the activity doesn't need to be secret. If it gets spoiled online with Chegg or whatever, it hasn't lost its value because it's an exercise for students and then an instructor would assess students um, through an exam or other methods to make sure that the students gathered that information. That's the basic structure of all the activities. Does that answer your question, Alan? I, I guess, um, ha have you drawn upon any educational theory to support those strategies? You know, um, is there general knowledge and education about how to address misconceptions? I would say, oops, excuse me, that's reminding me of my class. Um, <laughs> saved by the bell. Uh, I would say that one of the weaker aspects of the overall project is not being more familiar with the best way to remediate misconceptions. Um, it, that, it feels like a, a large challenge to improve um, how education is done. Um, and the main core of the project is identifying the misconceptions, creating and validating the CI. And so I think over time, as I continue to investigate those things, um, I, I'm sure that the exercises will get better, um, but that's definitely a way that the project could be improved, I think. Um, I have to go get ready for my next class. Um, well, 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 thank you so ahead. much. Um, uh, we'll put a copy of the video on the CDL website and on the U Cyber website. And we'll be back in two weeks when Josiah Dykstra will talk about myths in cybersecurity. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. I had a lot of fun. And you can always reach out if you have questions. Goodbye.